folks, it's happening. The battle of the in-game microphones. Two titans. If you're going down your path in the microphone kingdom, in terms of dynamic microphones, you're probably going to end on one of these two. So let's fight in a very respectful manner. <laughs> this video is brought to you by DistroKid. Yeah, I got a sponsor and it's DistroKid. I love DistroKid. I use them all the time. Are you kidding me? This was like a lot of work to set up this green screenshot. So I hope it looks even remotely good. Okay, so many of you guys already know my feelings towards these two microphones. There's definitely one microphone of these two that I prefer. But many of you, especially because these videos kind of end up in the search algorithms, many of you don't know that. I'm going to keep my opinion out of it until the end. Because to be completely honest, these two microphones are huge microphones that are oftentimes the last microphone that people end up buying, period. I'll have a couple of different comparisons, one of which is a blind test, so we can try and be objective about this whole thing. That being said, they are sonically very different microphones. I get why they're compared. They're a similar price point. They're both used for broadcast, but they are very different microphones. So different, in fact, that each of them are going to lend themselves to different vocal registers and different vocal styles in completely different ways on, you know, whatever track you published with DistroKid. <laughs> I hate myself. So for those of you who don't know, DistroKid is basically how you publish your music if you are an independent artist. Every band that I've been in, every project I've been a part of, I've used DistroKid long before they ever reached out to me. All of my old bands, which I will not show you the music of, but here's a clip. They've all been with DistroKid. That's how you get your stuff onto Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, so many different platforms. Now, whenever independent artists actually talk about publishing their work onto a platform, it's almost assumed that you're using DistroKid. It's the standard and for good reason. DistroKid actually gives you 100% of the earnings you earn from streaming music. So what that means is you'll pay a very modest fee starting at $20 for an entire year's worth of publishing. You could either get like a frozen meal from Applebee's or you could get your music published on all platforms. Do you want frozen steak from Applebee's? Or do you want all of your music to be heard by potentially hundreds of thousands of people? Crappy frozen food, or you can publish your work for everyone to see and earn all of the revenue from it instead of Applebee's. I don't see how that's not like the most appealing thing. If this is something that interests you, and it really should because this is how you get your music out to everyone in this world, I feel like we all get stuck in the creating phase and we never actually publish them. So this is a really valuable asset in order to do so. DistroKid has partnered with me and if you happen to use the link listed at the very top of my description, you're gonna get 7% off of whatever plan you choose. This is an awesome way to get a discounted price on a service that genuinely you're probably already going to use and it also supports me. So if you happen to use that link, I get a small commission from it and it's just a great way to support the channel. DistroKid is genuinely an amazing company that I use all the time and it's a complete honor that they considered me for doing this sponsorship and I, I just can't thank them enough because this is a really good company that I really full wholeheartedly support yeah thank you and let's get back to the comparison so as I've mentioned before these two microphones are like the titans of in-game microphones when it comes to dynamics and that fact has only increased more and more with the rise of content creation but on the point of content creation one of these two microphones stands far above the other, and that is the SM7B. It is the gold standard for microphones that are being put in front of a camera. So I wanna talk about the strengths of the Shure SM7B, first going over this exact point, the design. This microphone objectively looks nice. I don't believe anyone when they say they don't take into consideration the design of a microphone, especially a microphone that often ends up on video. And the fact is, the SM7B is an aesthetically very pleasing microphone. It looks good on camera. It looks good in almost any setup you use it in. It's industrial, and the design is a classic design. One of the other strengths you're going to find with the SM7B is an emphasis on the low-mid range. And oftentimes, with many voices, this is where the fundamentals of your voice lie, or the 
their words that they're speaking. The Shure SM7B by design boosts these frequencies. Okay, so I'm gonna interrupt myself and clarify my words here because boost was the wrong term to use. Let's throw up the frequency response for the SM7B. You're gonna notice there's actually not really a boost in the mid range unless you engage the boost. But what there is, is a really aggressive cut in the high end. This kind of sound profile inherently favors mid-range and low mid-range, giving the SM7B a darker tone to it, but it's not necessarily boosting those frequencies so much as it is not boosting the high end. By the way, if you're interested, I'm doing this with the RE20 on voiceover, but maybe you already guessed that. Which makes the voice sound more solidified. In fact, in nearly every video where I take a microphone, and I compare it to the Shure SM7B, the other microphone inevitably gets called nasally. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a condenser. It could be another dynamic. When another microphone is compared to the SM7B, the other one almost always gets called nasally. And that's because the SM7B has a lot of rich low-end support. This oftentimes leads to a richness in tone that makes it characterized as being warm, full, smooth, these are all adjectives that if we made some stupid word chart that people make, they would be on there for the SM7B. I'm not really in the business of giving a full list of technical information to you because I think websites do that a lot better than I do. I'll throw it on the screen real quick though, but I do wanna highlight a few technical aspects of the design that lead to this microphone's characteristic sound. Why is it so dark? What about the design makes that possible? Well, it's this side of the microphone right here. This is the resonance chamber, which is designed to take those low end frequencies and emphasize them further. Now, one of the ways that the Shure SM7B handles sibilance is through A, the pop shield on top, and also the fact that the capsule is so far back, but also because it has a pretty aggressive cut at the very ultra high end. This makes the Shure SM7B remarkably good at controlling sibilance. In fact, it might be the microphone that controls sibilance the best of any microphone I've ever heard. That's very impressive. On the note of the proximity effect, meaning the closer I get to the microphone, the more bass response you hear. The SM7B handles this by simply putting the capsule farther down into the microphone. This means no matter how close you get to the actual edge of the microphone, the capsule is still two or three inches away from you. This is Shore's technique for making your voice sound more even. Now we're gonna notice a little bit later with the RE20, they use a completely different approach. Okay, so we're gonna transition over to the RE20 now, and we're gonna talk about the strengths of this microphone because I've always kind of considered it the more edgy cousin to the Shure SM7B because the Shure SM7B is definitely the more popular of the two. So let's talk about how this microphone controls the proximity effect because it has a lot more nuanced way of doing so. Now, I don't know the actual technical reasons why this works, but these gills on the side of the microphone are used to control the proximity effect. So the capsule of the RE20 is not nearly as far away as it was on the Shure SM7B, but you'll notice if I get really close to it, it's really not that insane of a proximity effect. This microphone is designed in its form in order to handle the proximity effect as best as it can. And it does so really well, better than any dynamic microphone I've heard in the past, and I think better than the Shure SM7B. Hey guys, I, I probably should have mentioned this in the video, but many of you have probably already heard it anyways. This design helps with the proximity effect a lot, but one of the weaknesses of this design is it simply does not reject the same amount of plosives that the SM7B does. The SM7B has a mesh grill on the top, the capsule is really far back, plosives are kind of difficult to do on the SM7B, and plosives are just much more apparent on the RE20 unless you use some sort of grill to go with it. The RE20 is certainly more flat. It is not perfectly flat. It definitely has more of an emphasis on the high end, but those low end and even really low end ranges are not neglected. Rather than calling the RE20 perfectly flat, it's more realistic to say it has clarity in each one of these regions. Every one of these frequency ranges are very audible. That does not mean that there aren't certain frequency ranges on the RE20 that are more emphasized than others. Another strength of the RE20 is versatility. Now the Shure SM7B is known specifically for voiceover and live vocals and you could also say for guitar cabs. The RE20 is also known for all those things, but also very commonly used for kick drum and also for miking low-end acoustic instruments, things like contrabass or cello. I've often seen the RE20 placed on these things and I've used it myself and I think it sounds very good. I should note it's more even distribution of all frequencies might just make it more versatile on basically any application. If I don't know what I'm doing with a specific instrument, I'm going to be more inclined to reach for the RE20 because of its clarity in all these different frequency ranges over the Shure SM7B. This is because the Shure SM7B has particular interest in the low 
mid-range. And one of the big ones that's gonna lead us into our next section is the amount of gain required for the RE20. Let's talk about the spiel I've given in so many videos before. The Shure SM7B is a gain-hungry microphone, and that unfairly leads to a representation of the RE20 being the same because these are so often compared but the RE20 does not need as much gain as the Shure SM7B does. These things have about the same amount of gain as a Shure SM57, around 56 dBs of gain. The Shure SM7B has around 60 dBs of gain. Doesn't seem like a big difference, but it certainly is whenever you consider the amount of preamp gain found in most household interfaces, which is around 54 to 56 dBs. What I'm saying is when it comes to home studio recording, the Electro Voice is going to be more compatible with consumer level preamps than the SM7B is, unless you buy something like a cloud lifter. During this whole video, I've had the Shure SM7B lower than the RE20 because I know it's gonna get more noise if I boost it all the way. Let me show you what that sounds like. Hear that? That's the fuzziness from the preamp gain. Now I've made the point often that you don't necessarily need your preamp gain that loud on the Shure SM7B in order to make it function. The scenario in which a cloud lifter or any of these external preamp gains might be more necessary are live applications, particularly streaming. That being said, there's still ways around it. I'm gonna make a video about it. Processing, gates, compression, the right kind of EQ. You don't need a cloud lifter, okay? <laughs> if you're recording music, if you're recording anything that is pre-recorded and then you can boost it later, preamp gain ceases to be an issue, like this video. The Shure SM7B was recorded at a lower preamp gain, so I didn't make it too noisy. But yes, the RE20 is nicer to consumer level preamps. As I've stated at the beginning of this video, I have opinions. I have a microphone I prefer. I'm gonna hold off on it, which I know is not the stereotypical format for these videos. I usually talk about the microphone, give specs, give my opinion, vocal demonstration. But on this one, because it's a landmark comparison, I'm gonna do things a little bit different. We're going to do a regular vocal test. I'm going to do a blind guitar cab test because I think that's more applicable to these two microphones. And then I will give my opinion. Dude, Brooklyn is so loud. I guess that's a good vocal rejection thing. Today we have Seth Clayton doing vocals for us. Uh, go check out his Instagram if you get the chance. He just released a new single called The Runner out now. Seth was super nice in order to help out with this review. Um, I can't thank him enough for it. I just moved here. So to have someone offer their um, vocals and their talents for this right off the bat has been amazing. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the demonstrations. You cross the boundary, you get under the ego, I wrap around me. Mind if we loosen these clothes and I'm like, pinch me. And I say yes, I mean no, when you undress me slow. Tu as la peau la plus douce que je connaisse Elle est faite pour que je la caresse Je vais mettre mon oreille sur ton ventre Pour voir s'il y a quelqu'un là-dedans Touching your skin Is my medicine I get the feeling I'm healing Touching your skin Yeah You cross the boundary You get under the ego I wrap around me Mind if we loosen these clothes And I'm like, pinch me And I say yes, I mean no And you undress me Slow Tu as la peau la plus douce que je connaisse Elle est faite pour que je la caresse Je vais mettre mon oreille sur ton ventre Pour voir s'il y a quelqu'un là-dedans Touching your skin Is my medicine I get the feeling I'm healing Touching your skin Yeah You want to tell the camera if you preferred a mic or if you had a thought? Yeah, I did like the second mic. I'm very aware of this guy's bias, but <laughs> I like the second mic. Um, it did, it felt warmer, it felt warmer, and it felt more, I don't know, the first one had this kind of like robotic 
sound to me. You know, I don't know, maybe I was making it up, but it sounded kind of like tinian and robotic on the first one. <laughs> The SM7B sounds really good on cabinets. Really good. All right, here's the promised opinion. I like the RE20 better for a few reasons. One, the obvious one, let's get it out of the way, the preamp gain. And the other reason is frankly a little bit more subjective. The sound profile of the RE20, I like that it has more presence, I like that it's more bright, and I like that it has a much more even distribution of frequencies without the buildup in the low mid range. Okay, so I've had some projects in the past where I've made voiceover chains for the Shure SM7B, namely for podcasts. And every time you need to add more high-end presence to that sound, that's a pretty stereotypical curve for voiceover. We have a low end cut, we have some little dips where we want the resonant frequencies of the voice to be a little bit lower in the mid-range and we add a high-end shelf. So what I'm saying is when you process a Shure SM7B, you are almost always adding in the high-end that is not inherently in this microphone. With the RE20, you don't have to do that as much. In terms of broadcast and voiceover, which let's be honest, is the main use for these two microphones, the RE20 has that sound profile right out of the box. You just want to emphasize it more with processing. That being said, the Shure SM7B definitely has some benefits. Namely, the sibilance is incredibly well controlled on a Shure SM7B. Not to mention the design, it's, it just looks nicer. Look, when it comes to the Shure SM7B, all I ask is that you know what you're getting into. The RE20 is not as big of a jump, to be quite honest, which is ironic because the Shure SM7B is everywhere. You can buy it literally anywhere, and the RE20 is a little bit harder to come by. But the Shure SM7B is still not as much of a beginner microphone. Neither of these are. But the Shure SM7B is less so a beginner microphone. If you're using it for live application, and I stress, this is kind of the only time this is really important, contrary to what public opinion might have you believe. But if you're using a Shure SM7B for live application, you're going to need some level of knowledge for processing, making an EQ curve, compression, learning how to do a gate, all these things in order to control the noise for proper levels. Negative 12, negative 18 dB. I've said it so many times. It's a great mic, but many people use it because their favorite creator uses it and they know nothing else about it. As long as you're aware of what you're getting into and some of the downsides of the Shure SM7B, and you're okay with just the sound profile of it and the design, because yes, that's part of it, then get the Shure SM7B. But honestly, if you're looking for a microphone that's more ready for you right off the bat, the RE20 is your microphone. It's the one for you. One more thing before I go, and this is kind of a good thing, but it's also unfortunate. It's getting harder and harder to respond to all these comments I'm getting. And don't get me wrong, I'm still going to respond to all of them to the best of my ability, except for like the mean ones. But if you want to have like a genuine conversation, I know this sounds like a plug, but it, it's genuinely so much easier to do so on Instagram. So if you want to follow me on Instagram at Real Audio Haze, that is the easiest way to talk to me about gear uh, and just to have more of a back and forth than on YouTube. And if you want to work on a project with me or if you would like lessons, you can email me at realaudiohaze at gmail.com. And with that, folks, thanks for sticking around. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. Hey.